Good evening, everybody. I'm Pehu, and uh, I am today. I will be anchoring for today's guest lecture with my partner Pranjal over here. As you all are aware, today's lecture is the third in the guest lecture series on German women's writing. Pranjal and I are also currently studying the same under our extremely passionate professor, Dr. Shruti Jain. Uh, this guest lecture series is being organized in collaboration with the German Academic Exchange, the DAAD. Hence, with this, we would now like to welcome all of you on the behalf of our uh, of the Center for Foreign Languages to the online guest lecture on the topic "Writing for Mice: Post-Human, Post-Gender Ecography in Marlin Horsofels, The Wall." I personally am extremely excited about today's lecture. What about you, Pranjal? Hi, everyone. I'm Pranjal Chori. Good evening. I'm your co-anchor for the day, the co-student anchor. Uh, I'm really excited to view because today's panel has something very unique and interesting coming up for discussion today. Uh, so before that, in the last two lectures, we've introduced German women's literature from a queer theory lens and its development through the different waves of feminism. We've also analyzed womanhood in conflicts through um, the text "A Woman in Berlin" by Martha Hellers and looked at German literary development uh, through a larger political perspective on the individual's perspective of conflict. But in today's lecture, we're going to draw on these very fundamental notions of German feminist history and take a more microscopic lens towards the construction of uh, the woman through Marilyn Haushofer's book, The Wall. Now, The Wall is a short but very dense text that uh, challenges our traditional notion of uh, feminism in action, almost. Uh, Marilyn Haushofer offers us this nameless female character who is the sole narrator of the text, stranded by herself in a world that collapsed around her. And now she's forced to survive in mind and body by herself, uh, with the exception of her befriending a few animals through the two-year uh, journey or the account that she makes in the form of this book. And these animals will aid and influence her journey as you read the text. Now, I'm not sure how many members of our audience have read this text during the pandemic, which is actually when it regained its popularity. But I really enjoyed this book as a post-COVID read. That's because it resonated with me uh, in a way that it describes the trials of isolation and loneliness and the space for resistance in this sort of solitude. And this is especially because Marlene Haushofer draws a lot from her personal experiences because she was a housewife who was living in a very traditional living space and she didn't quite receive the fame and recognition that her text would eventually warrant and gain posthumously. So these texts are now widely recognized as deeply complex but simple in their narration and one reading in my opinion is never enough for it. In fact, I think many of our readers uh, and the audience members today have caught on to the little sneak peeks that we've left in our lecture invites. For example, uh, in today's lecture, we had the goddess Artemis and her dogs. Um, and I'm really excited to see how many of you have already connected that to what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, you know, it's very interesting, Pranjal, that you mentioned the invite for this event because I personally have always wanted to see how cross-cultural interactions um, uh, per uh, cleared uh, into literature and it is extremely fascinating to me that uh, postmodern German literature can draw from Greek mythology so closely while being so far apart in history. You know exactly like our text today is of Austrian origin it's not German per se and uh, Dr. Shruti Jain made it very clear to us that she's got an exciting introduction lined up for us. Uh, Dr. Shruti Jain is not only a German linguistic expert but she's also deeply interested in the literary construction of womanhood against the background of larger political conflict. Her research is going to set the stage for us today in understanding the cultural exchanges between Austrian and German feminist works. And then we're going to proceed to see exactly how uh, skillfully Marilyn Haushofer incorporated her personal experiences with womanhood into her text and emphasize the gender spectrum of care and responsibility. Dr. Jen, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Pranjal and Pihu. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so, um, in the last lecture, as uh, Pranjal and Pihu just said, yeah, that, the lecture that was delivered by Dr. Pallavi from Tezpur University, Assam, we looked at the theme of violence against women in conflicting situations as voiced by Anu Numa. Yes, so I was talking about, uh, well, the correction that uh, I wanted to make, and I want to call it after the discussion, Anonyma and not Martha Hillers, and I want to call it not a novel, but a diary novel, um, A Woman in Berlin. So in today's lecture, we do not only move on in time, uh, but also shift in space. Uh, 
Today's lecture will be the first among the three in this guest lecture series that is devoted to a work written by an Austrian woman writer. Uh, for a long time, one did not distinguish between literature produced in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Literature produced in German language was also simply considered to be German literature. Recent scholarship, however, takes a more nuanced approach to the subject and distinguishes between the various literatures based on the differences in the historical and sociopolitical trajectories that the countries have undergone. It is therefore only appropriate to spend a little time to reflect upon the history of the Austrian women's movement and the invaluable contribution made by Austrian women writers to the feminist literary discourse of German speaking countries. In the introduction of her book, Against the Horizon, Feminism and Post-War Austrian Authors, published, first published in 1988, Jacqueline Vincent provides a broad historical overview and discusses some of the factors influencing the development of women's literature in Austria from 1918 to the present. Um, here we are told that like in Germany, women's suffrage was introduced in Austria on 12th November, 1918 with the foundation of the Republic of Austria after the fall of the Habsburg monarchy, um, Habsburg monarchy, monarchy uh, with the end of um, World War I. But reforms such as the Equal Rights Statute that forbade uh, privileges on the basis of birth, sex, status, class, and religion hardly evolved into their practical application. Um, only a small segment of Austrian society fully supported issues such as women's social, social and legal equality. As a result, most women faced what is called Doppelbelastung, where they had not only to cater to the protection of the family unit, but also had to contribute to the labor market. With the rise of National Socialism in Austria after 1938, women were barred from white collar positions such as lawyers, judges, doctors, or even teachers to some extent. Moreover, the entire female uh, student population was reduced to 10%. Women were forced into agricultural and domestic work and were required to work for one year on a farm or in a private home. It was called the Weibliches Plichtjahr. It was not until the 70s that an independent women's movement emerged in Austria. One witnesses here revisions of laws regarding marriage, abortion and family planning, for, for property and divorce and equal pay for equal work. The socio-political and historical developments in Austria clearly impacted and continue to impact women's writing. Although the list of women writers in, of Austrian origin is exhaustive, post-World War II writers such as Marlene Haushofer, Ilse Eichinger, Ingeborg Bachmann, who, is, who we're gonna look at in the next series, in the next talk of the series, Christina Nöstling, Nöstlinger, Marie Theresa Kerschbaumer, Barbara Schmidt, Frischmuth, Elfriede Jelinek, <coughs> who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2004 and is also going to be the last author who we are going to discuss in this guest lecture series. Anna Mitputsch and Brigitte Schweiger and Marlene Sterowitz have received a wider reception both in German and non German speaking worlds. The collapse of the National Socialism created a political and cultural vacuum, which invited a search for and discovery of new cultural identity. For women writers, the release from the oppressive political system, which demanded blut und boden literature, therefore resulted in the research for a new identity in which women were not confined to reproduction. A large number of debutants entered the literary scene, producing and publishing their works in magazines and journals. But as the Austrian literary market was not yet developed enough for writers to survive on the professional level, many went elsewhere for financial support. Now here comes the word Gruppe 47, an association, an, an informal association of German speaking um, writers that was founded in 1947 by the famous German author Hans Werner Richter. And two of the very important um, Austrian women writers were accepted in this group, namely Ilse Eichinger and Ingeborg Bachmann. 
In her essay titled Illuminating Inter Intersections, 10 Years of Feminist Criticism on Contemporary Austrian Women Writers, Vincent and analyzes the feminist reception of selected works written by Austrian women writers from the 1970s to the 1990s, and illustrates how secondary literature based on Austrian women writing can be categorized roughly under the rubrics of mother-daughter relations, Austria's national socialist past, language and gender, the female other meets the foreign other, and the inter intertextual allusion. But of course, these are not the only modes in which one can interpret the texts. Today's lecture, for example, draws our attention to the animal ecofeminist discourse in the wall by Marlene Haushofer, which is published in 1963. In her essay titled, The Friendship of Our Distant Relations, Feminism and Animal Families in Marlene Haushofer's Divan, Anna Richards writes, and I quote, Austria of the 1950s and the 1960s was not an easy place to be a woman or a non-human animal. I am very glad that we have Dr. Anupande amongst us who will help us unravel the mystery surrounding the woman and animal in the narrative account of the world. I thank Dr. Alexander Phillips, my neighbor from across the National Highway 44, I often, as I often refer to him, to have agreed to chair today's session. And I thank everyone else for joining us today. With this, I would now like to hand over the virtual mic back to the student anchors. Over to you, Pranjal and Pihu. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shridijan, for sharing such insightful notions with us. Now we would like to introduce the chairperson for this guest lecture, Professor Alexander Phillips, an assess, uh, assistant professor at, um, of English at Ashoka University. He has completed a PhD and master's in German studies from Cornell University. He has also earned a master's degree in comparative uh, literature and German studies from the University of California. Uh, he was a part of the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service at the Humboldt University in Berlin. With this, we would uh, request Dr. Phillips to kindly um, take the session ahead and help us all introspect on this piece of literature. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, listening to Pihu and Pranjal's conversation about the novel at the beginning reminded me of when I taught this novel at Ashoka a few years ago. I told the students, uh, before our session, just so you know, the dog dies at the end and the room erupted in a chorus of no. <laughs> but um, I'm pleased to introduce the real star of the show, uh, Dr. Anu Pandey. Uh, Dr. Pandey is an assistant professor in the Department of Germanic Studies at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. She holds a PhD from the Center of German Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi where she taught from 2004 to 2009. She has published on Berenfahrt Vesper, Brett Easton, and Marlene Haushofer, who is the subject of today's talk, as well on topics related to animal ethics and the autobiographies of people living with HIV AIDS. Her talk today, as we know, is called Writing for Mice, Post-Human, Post-Gender Ecography in Marlene Haushofer's The Wall. Uh, so I will hand over the floor to Dr. Pandey. Thank you, Alexander, uh, for this wonderful introduction. I'm really happy to be here today with all of you. Um, so a big, big thank you uh, to the OP General Global University and to the DRD, and uh, most especially to Shruti for extending the invitation to be a part of this wonderful initiative. I really enjoyed the first two lectures in the series, and I look forward to uh, what happens today, as well as to the lectures that are yet to come. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to mention very briefly how I came across this novel. Uh, it was quite by accident. I have been living in very close proximity to dogs <laughs> for a very long time. And this is a fact that's known to all my friends as well uh, and my students meanwhile. And um, it was a German friend that I was staying with sometime in 2005, I think. So a really long time ago. And... Um, she just said, oh, there's this novel that you absolutely must read. You will love it. And she gave me her copy. And uh, we were supposed to go to bed eventually. But um, I just wanted to read a few pages before I turned in. And then I actually didn't turn in at all. I just stayed up reading it because I was completely engrossed for obvious reasons. I mean, because of the dog connection, of course. 
um, which drew me, but because there was also a whole lot else going on in the novel, which uh, was deeply engaging and which left my brain buzzing so that it was impossible to sleep. And I hope to be able to share some of that with all of you today. I am going to start sharing or trying to share my slides with you now. So, published in 1963, The Wall was the last and most successful of the three novels by Austrian writer Marlene Haushofer. Her two previous novels were titled Eine Hand voll Leben, published in 1955, and Die Tapeten Tour, 1957. The Wall is a first-person narrative by the sole survivor of an unnamed, unspecified catastrophe, a middle-aged woman who states that she's writing to keep insanity and death at bay, although she doesn't know if her report will ever be read by anyone. A weekend trip to her cousin's hunting lodge, along with the cousin and her husband, turns into the beginning of a radically new existence. Her hosts go out for the evening to the nearby village, and the narrator wakes up the next morning to realize that they haven't returned. She sets out to look for them, accompanied by their dog, Lux, and discovers that an invisible but impenetrable wall has come up overnight, blocking their way beyond a certain point. All life beyond the wall seems petrified, while the narrator finds herself imprisoned and yet saved on her side of the wall. The novel is an account of how she, a city dweller so far, survives in this prison, which is simultaneously also a sanctuary, along with the dog books, a pregnant cow she finds who gives birth to a male calf, and a cat and her offspring. The narrator is never named in the narrative, since names have no relevance in a world devoid of other humans, and she realizes that her hopeless situation is simultaneously liberating. The Wall became a bestseller in the 1980s, actually, and not at the time of its publication in the 1960s, when the feminist movement saw it as a vision of liberation and emancipation from patriarchy, and the peace movement saw it as the depiction of a post-nuclear apocalypse. Both movements were, at that point, still essentially humanist and anthropocentric, since they saw the novel as a representation of human isolation. However, the novel also draws attention to more than human concerns as it engages with the possibility of survival and a new beginning. To a certain extent, the novel anticipates a post-humanist, post-anthropocentric worldview, which has become popular since the beginning of the 21st century. The time when the novel was published, the 1960s, explains to a large extent the questions and issues that it engages with. The world had experienced two world wars, which had shaken and jeopardized the belief in the humanist tradition and the possibility of social ascent and improvement through technological progress. Disappointed with the experience of brutality in the two wars which took place in a century when human society was believed to have reached the pinnacle of civilization, people started longing for a return to primitivism and now animals, even the wild and untamed ones were not seen as enemies of humanity, but rather as its redemption. The narrator in Haushofer's novel admits multiple times that she would not have survived the first winter without the animals. She says she would have committed suicide if it weren't for them. Although she says that the dog, the cow and the calf, the cat, as well as all her offspring were dependent, dependent on her, she concedes that her dependence on them was far greater. In the 1960s, a time when the world was threatened afresh with war and annihilation as a result of the nuclear arms race between the superpowers during the Cold War, it is surely no accident that the sole survivor of the catastrophe is a woman and her companions are a bunch of animals. They constitute in this sense the other both of them as a woman and the animals in an anthropocentric world. The unnamed apocalypse, as well as the two world wars, are man-made, quite literally, but women and animals are affected by them as well. The narrator regrets that animals have always become collateral damage in human-made wars, post-apocalyptic world which she inhabits with the animals is a world without men, 
where a woman and the animals survive and set up a new world. The narrator reports that everybody was discussing the Cold War before the events she describes in the novel and believes that the mysterious wall is perhaps a secret weapon developed by one of the superpowers and expresses the wish that the animals could have been spared. A brief outline um, of the structure of my talk today. I will be talking about how um, the novel discusses the relationship between human and non-human animals and takes up the issue of anthropocentrism in this regard, whereby we will be able to see um, how the narrator sort of exhibits a certain continuity with the anthropocentric tradition in some senses, whereas in other respects, there is a marked rupture with this tradition. In the second part of the talk, um, I will try to bring about, to bring up the aspect of gender as it plays out in a world in which there are no more humans. And finally, I will uh, talk about the relevance of writing as discussed in the novel in a post-human world. We were in a bad situation, Luke and I, and at the time we didn't know how bad it was, but we weren't completely lost because we were together. This bad situation was created by the emergence of the wall, but the narrator didn't feel entirely lost in this puzzling and scary situation because she had Luke's by her side. Luke's gave her courage. Luke's is a dog. Afflicted by an unspecified catastrophe, human and canine survivor find themselves in the same boat. Furthermore, two individuals belonging to two different species come together to form a we. In this way, the novel raises some very pertinent questions about human and animal life, their similarities and differences, as well as their coexistence on this planet. In approaching the question of the animal, the first person narrator's account subscribes to anthropocentrism in some instances and exhibits a rupture with it in others. We will consider the continuation of the anthropocentric worldview first before we examine her departure from it. Anthropocentrism has determined philosophical traditions, including in Europe, since a long time. And it is only in fairly recent times that the animal turn in humanities and social sciences has started to question and discard it. Speaking of the animal provided a convenient term which was used in contrast with the most important categories associated with the modern human view, such as humanity, culture, and reason, in order to define them through the contrast. Animals were understood as the antithesis of the human. In other words, humans are human precisely because they aren't animals. The appropriation of animals in everyday life, as well as in literature, has been based on this belief in an anthropological difference, namely the belief that there is a clear and insurmountable difference between human and non-human animals. Initially, the first person um, narrator in the world too seems to subscribe to this anthropological difference and the anthropocentric worldview that emanates from it. She describes how in the early days after the emergence of the wall, she endeavored to cling on to the sparse or meager remains of a human routine, even though there was no human company or society left, because she was afraid that she would gradually stop being human otherwise. She says, not that I was afraid of turning into an animal, not that it would be too bad, but a human being can never become an animal. He would fall past the animal into an abyss. This statement reminds of Heidegger's claim that an abyss or a chasm separates the animal from the human, that animals are poor in world, welt are, whereas humans are welt bildend, world forming. Heidegger defines animals in contrast to humans through a lack. According to him, animals lack hands and history. They can produce sounds, but not speech. They lack the ability to comprehend space as space. They have a physical body, but no subjective conception of their body. Furthermore, Heidegger claims that only a being that can speak and think can have hands. Humans have hands, animals don't, the way humans do. 
what they possess is a prehensile organ with which they can grab and seize objects. Humans have hands that do more than this. They signify, and therefore there is for Heidegger a fundamental difference between human hands and the claws, paws, and talons of animals. The hand is thus a distinguishing characteristic of humans. The narrator in the wall seems to share this belief that animals are different from humans, basically because of their lack of hands and language. She says about the dog looks, Manchmal bildete ich mir ein, dass Wuchs, deren ihm plötzlich Hände gewachsen, bald auch zu denken und zu reden angefangen hätte. Sometimes I imagined that Wuchs, if he were to suddenly grow a pair of hands, would soon start thinking and talking as well. Elsewhere, she describes Wuchs as her Freund und Wächter, a friend and a guard or guardian, who tried to cheer her up who knew much better than she did what was good for her, but couldn't think and speak. On the other hand, she describes also how he didn't want to leave her alone during a storm, obgleich alles ihn dazu trieb, sich ins Ofenloch, in die sichere Höhle zu verkriechen. Um, uh, although everything drove him to crawl, crawl into the fireplace, into the safety of the cave. On this occasion, the dog's behavior went against his native or innate flight instinct, a fact that seems to contradict the assumption that animals are creatures of instinct who cannot think. Ever since the animal turn, the concept of language has been expanded to accommodate more than human forms of communication. Language is no more merely human language. Instead, it includes, includes the traces, visual, olfactory, haptic, or oral of non-human presence as well. We now know that the positioning of a dog's tail, the perking up of their ears, their rigid or relaxed stance, their bristling fur, their gaze, all constitute canine language through which they communicate. Training dogs is one field where the communication between canines and humans plays a central role and is clearly visible. An important tool developed to investigate multi-species communication is that of kinesthetic um, empathy, which is an openness and respectful attention to more than human forms of communication. This acknowledgement of multi-species language shows up the fallacy of the belief that animals lack speech or language and opens up the possibility of a successful communication between human and non-human animals, which is based on mutual comprehension. Several examples of this communication across species are found in Haushofer's novel. Despite her assumption that Luke's cannot think and speak, the narrator nevertheless admits that she's able to communicate with him. I quote from the novel, Ich redete damals viel mit ihm und er verstand fast alles, was ich sagte. Dem Sinn nach. Wer weiß. Vielleicht verstand er auch schon mehr Wörter, als ich dachte. In jenem Sommer vergaß ich ganz, dass Lutz ein Hund war und ich ein Mensch. Ich wusste es, aber es hatte jede trennende Bedeutung verloren. The ability to successfully communicate with Lux offers the narrator an opportunity to overcome the barriers between human and non-human animals or at least to forget for a while that such a barrier exists. At the same time, she stops short of questioning the belief that humans occupy a special position in the scheme of things, which is based on anthropocentrism. From time to time, she finds herself compelled to go hunting without ever being able to get used to it. She continues to find it horrible, bloody, and disgusting, and never makes a note of it in her calendar. Hunting is an unavoidable part of her survival strategy. Her life, as well as the life of her animals, depends on having enough food. Expressing her strong dislike for hunting serves thus as proof of her love for animals. 
However, I would like to argue that the reason she gives for hunting shows that it is instead an anthropocentric gesture connected to the belief in human exceptionalism. She states multiple times that if she weren't to hunt, she wouldn't be able to survive. And more importantly, she wouldn't be able to save the animals who are with her, since she, the sole human, is the only one who can save them. And that's why her survival is of prime importance. In other words, some animals must be sacrificed for the good of all. An argument, incidentally, that is also given by scientists to justify animal experiments. Seen from this point of view, hunting some animals is unavoidable in the novel, and hence it is presented to the readers in a pragmatic manner, without overt sentimentality. Writing about animals in the fiction of modernity, Philip Armstrong draws attention to this tendency to present, to represent animal deaths realistically. I quote, the animal's deaths are presented to the public eye according to that genre of realism which purports to offer unmediated access to the inevitable, the irresistible, the way things must be. They are real deaths and really seen, but presented in a way that demands from the viewers a response that is also realistic as that term is understood by capitalist and scientific modernity. That is, as a pragmatic recognition that certain kinds of suffering and deprivation are unavoidable and must be accepted in the pursuit of progress or profit. In accordance with this argument, the narrator in Haushofer's novel too learns to hunt as quickly and skillfully as possible. And after a while, she is able to finish this unavoidable business without useless reservations or concerns. Also, owner nutslows a bedenken. At this juncture, I would like to draw attention to two other peculiarities in the depiction of animal killings in the novel. Firstly, the narrator seems to subscribe to the view that there is a certain hierarchy in the animal kingdom. She often fishes for trout and acknowledges that this does not disturb her as much, although she cannot explain this discrimination. On the other hand, hunting deer seems to her particularly reprehensible and almost like betrayal. Besonders verwerflich, fast wie ein Verrat. Warm-blooded animals like deer, crows and the other wild animals out there arouse compassion in her, whereas she is able to hunt cold-blooded animals for food without compunction. Warm-blooded animals who share this quality with humans seem to her more alive and more sensitive to pain than cold-blooded ones. She admits as much when she says, Mein Vorstellungsvermögen ist sehr begrenzt. Es reicht nicht bis ins glatte, weiße Fleisch der Kaltblüter. Und wie fremd sind mir die Insekten? My imagination is very limited. It doesn't reach all the way into the smooth white flesh of cold-blooded animals. And how alien are the insects to me? Secondly, she also kills some animals out of compassion because as she claims, she is human and cannot just watch an animal suffering. Instead, she feels that she has to support the suffering animals and release them from their misery. What she refers to here is the burden of responsibility which humans are supposed to bear and which can be traced back to the belief in human exceptionalism. She expresses this outlook in the following entry in her journal. Das einzige Wesen im Wald, das wirklich Recht oder Unrecht tun kann, bin ich. Und nur ich kann Gnade üben. Manchmal wünsche ich mir, diese Last der Entscheidung liege nicht auf mir. Aber ich bin ein Mensch und ich kann nur denken und handeln wie ein Mensch. Davon wird mich erst der Tod befreien. The only creature in the forest that can really do right or wrong is me. 
and only I can show mercy. Sometimes I wish I didn't have to bear this burden of decision making, but I am human and I can only think and act as a human. Only death will free me from that. Because the superiority of animals based on the anthropological difference is normally never questioned, humans assume the duty of being responsible for animals and deciding about their lives and deaths. The narrator too is convinced that only she can save herself and the animals. And once when she finds herself contemplating suicide, she is prepared to kill the cow Bella and her calf because she is convinced that without her, they would starve to death in the winter. Once she finds four dead chamois in the forest and sees herself confronted again with the burden of making a decision about the rest of the chamois population in the forest. She believes paradoxically that they needed to be killed to be saved. Eigentlich gehörten sie alle abgeschossen um die Seuche zum Erlöschen zu bringen und die armen Tiere von ihren Leiden zu erlösen. Aber ich hätte sie von dieser Entfernung nicht getroffen und ich musste mit meiner Munition sparsam umgehen. Also blieb mir nichts übrig, als das Elend mit anzusehen. Actually, they should all be shot down to end the plague and put the poor animals out of their suffering. But I wouldn't have managed to hit them from that range, and I had to be careful with my ammunition. So I had no choice but to just watch the misery. Her decision not to shoot the chamois is a practical decision based on rational thought. Erika Fudge offers another explanation for animal euthanasia, which is considered a sign of human compassion or mercy under certain circumstances in the real world as well. Fudge sees the middle-class-led campaigns for animal protection as an expression of the wish not to have to witness cruelty, which she further interprets as a sign of bourgeois modernity. According to her, it is the injured feelings of the humans who are confronted with animal cruelty that take center stage here and not the animals themselves. In fact, the animals become almost secondary. Accordingly, the narrator in Haushofer's novel is less concerned with mercy and perhaps more with the selfish desire to be spared the sight of animal suffering. In general, the narrator's account of the animals is characterized by a marked sentimentality and anthropomorphism, an approach which is often maligned and ridiculed for being irrational or for erasing the animality of the animals. However, Jeff Wallace contends that differences between humans and animals can seep through both ways. In this sense, anthropomorphism is not a fallacy but rather an acknowledgement of the relationship between human and non-human animals. I quote, analogy can work both ways. If we are like them, they are like us. To the extent that we are animal, they are human. Haushofer's narrator describes the cow Bella as her sister and the dog looks as her friend. The descriptions of looks in particular are characterized by strong sentimentality. She notes that time stands still since his death and she feels like an amputee. After his death, she often has the feeling that he is still around. I quote, Wo anders sollte seine kleine Hunde Seele spucken als auf meiner Spur. Looks, schöner brave Hund, mein Hund. Wahrscheinlich mach nur mein armer Kopf das Geräusch deiner Tritte, den Schimmer deines Fells. Solange es mich gibt, wirst du meine Spur verfolgen. Hungrig und sehnsüchtig. She sees Lux's death as a supreme sacrifice and writes, selbst wenn er keine andere Wahl hatte, 
mehr als sein Leben konnte er nicht für mich einsetzen. Es war ja alles, was er besaß, ein kurzes, glückliches Unterleben. She also feels a close affinity with the cat. Rejecting the belief that humans can only identify with other humans, she states, Ich fand keinen allzu großen Unterschied zwischen ihr und mir. Ich konnte zwar wählen, aber nur mit dem Kopf und das war für mich so gut wie gar nicht. Die Katze und ich, wir waren aus demselben Stoff gemacht und wir saßen im gleichen Boot, das mit allem, was da lebte, auf die großen dunklen Fälle zu treten. This is in line with the argument that there are undeniable differences between human and non-human animals, but there are several similarities as well. And the presence of differences does not negate these similarities. What this also shows is that the differences on borders, which seem evident and insurmountable in the normal course of urban life, lose their validity as soon as the signs of urban civilization disappear and the humans find themselves in an extraordinary situation where the only thing that matters is survival. Initially, the narrator longs for other humans and is disturbed by the thought that there might be no humans left anywhere on the earth at all. At the same time, she undertakes certain measures for her safety. She locks up everything and starts carrying a knife at all times. Soon, however, She realizes how ridiculous such measures are since they are directed against humans. She explains this in the following words. Aber da bisher jede Gefahr von Menschen gedroht hatte, konnte ich mich nicht so schnell umstellen. Der einzige Feind, den ich in meinem bisherigen Leben gekannt hatte, war der Mensch gewesen. The longing for her conspecifics for other humans is soon replaced by relief that there are no more humans in her paradise, which is simultaneously her prison. Thinking about the hunter who had earlier looked after Lux and who was supposedly a good person, she realizes she is happy that he isn't there either. Because, as she says, wer weiß, was die Gefangenschaft aus diesem unauffälligen Mann gemacht hätte. Vielleicht können mich überhaupt nur, nur Tiere ertragen. The narrator clearly has no faith in humans and is almost misanthropic after she has been away from human society for a while. She starts seeing her lonely life in the forest as paradise and her earlier life in human society as meaningless. In fact, the only thing that she claims to find boring are a few old newspapers in the hunting lodge, which are almost her last connection to her former life and to the world of humans. In fact, she starts rejecting humans at a subconscious level as well. Once when she is sick, she dreams in a feverish delirium of several unknown people who are behaving very badly. And on another occasion, she dreams that she's giving birth to animals. She does not find such dreams horrible or disturbing and says, es sieht nur befremdend aus, wenn ich es niederschreibe, in Menschenschrift und Menschenworten. So it is human language and thought that has created the abyss between humans and non-human animals. In other words, it is an artificial construct. Eventually, the narrator feels completely alienated from the world of humans, whereas she feels that only animals can tolerate her and she only feels well and safe around them. When a man suddenly and finally appears at the end of the novel and kills Luke's and the calf, the narrator sees him as an ugly presence and kills him. Her last misanthropic gesture consists in pushing the man's corpse down the tree slope, whereas she buries Luke's in a grave. Another thing um, that comes up quite clearly in this novel is um, the idea of the animal, which, um, as Jacques Derrida has pointed out, 
is an artificial construct. The um, narrator in Haushofer's novel endeavors all the time not to speak of the animal as a category, but instead she speaks always of the animals, for example, of my animals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she also um, makes sure that each of the animals that she writes about in the novel is presented as an individual with his or her own personality. Jacques Derrida writes in uh, L'Animal que donc je suis, The Animal that Therefore I Am, confined within this catch all concept, within this vast encampment of the animal, in this general singular, within the strict enclosure of this definite article, the animal and not animals, as in a virgin forest, a zoo, a hunting or fishing ground, a paddock or an abattoir, a space of domestication, are all the living things that man does not recognize as his fellows, his neighbors, or his brothers. Instead of the word animo with A-U-X at the end, which is the French word for um, animals, um, Derrida proposes an alternative, the word animo, spelled with M-O-T, um, more, M-O-T is word in French, thereby drawing attention to the fact that the term, the animal, is an artificial construct and that um, there is no such thing as the animal in the world. And uh, when one uses such a, a term, one is basically trying to come up with a convenient category that can be used to contrast with the human and thereby to define the human. The uh, narrator in Haushofer's novel also presents her animals, the animals with all their distinct personalities instead of speaking about the animal. So Lux, for example, is described as nicht nur mein Hund, sondern mein Freund, mein einziger Freund in einer Welt der Mühen und Einsamkeit. Er verstand alles, was ich sagte, wusste, ob ich traurig oder heiter war, und versuchte auf seine einfache Art nicht zu trösten. He is not just my friend, my dog, but my friend, my only friend in a world of toil and loneliness. He understood everything I said, knew if I was sad or happy, and tried to comfort me in his simple way. She also describes him as neugierig, curious, and vernünftig. Sensible. The cat, on the other hand, she says, finds herself always in einem Zustand der Fluchtbereitschaft und Spannung. She is always in a, a state of readiness to flee, to get away, and um, in a state of tension or excitement. Bella the cow is described by her as eine große, sanfte Nährmutter, eine arme, geduldige Schwester die ihr Los mit mehr Würde trägt als ich. So as a kind of big, gentle, nurturing mother figure, or in other instances, a poor, patient sister who bears her lot on her fate with more dignity than I do. Having said that, one must also acknowledge that, um, that a certain amount of animal stereotypes do persist in the novel, most primarily in the way Lux, the dog, and the cat are described. So Lux uh, stereotypically is the dog that is a loyal companion and uh, willing to uh, sacrifice his life for his human. And the cat is presented much more as a distrustful um, creature who is more um, interested in the house, more connected to the house where she stays, and not so much to the human. Another thing that, um, that Haushofer's narrator discusses in the novel to uh, quite some extent is the question of life and death, again, as a category which has been used to distinguish between humans and animals, whereby um, a lot of continental philosophy um, suggests that humans exist 
in the full sense of the term or have a, a, an existence um, and therefore also a death, which connected to the fact of grievability is a real death. Whereas animals just live, they function, and then at some point of time they perish. And because um, their death is not grievable the way human death is, it cannot really be seen as death. About this, the narrator writes, Vielleicht leben die Tiere bis zu ihrem Tod in einer Welt des Schreckens und Entzückens. Sie können nicht fliehen und müssen die Wirklichkeit bis zu ihrem Ende ertragen. Selbst ihr Tod ist ohne Trost und Hoffnung. Ein wirklicher Tod. Perhaps the animals live in a world of terror and rapture until they die. Unable to escape, they must endure reality to the end. Even their death is without consolation and hope, a real death. This uh, can be connected to uh, of what Nietzsche writes about humans and animals. Um, Nietzsche sees the silence of the animals not as a lack, but rather as a sign of a kind of superior and special wisdom that they have. He believes that animals don't need to speak, they don't need a language because they live really intensively in the presence. And they live intensively in the presence because they do not carry the burden of the past uh, in the form of memories and they do not have to worry about the future and therefore their life in the present is what matters. It's the only thing that they, um, that they live and therefore it's much more intense than the case than is the case for humans. Um, and Nietzsche also believes that some of this lost animality is what humans need to, rede to redeem and to regain if they wish to live um, as honorably and as intensively and really as animals. Isolation behind the wall and living with animals is therefore presented in the novel not as, um, as a situation which is marked by lack, but as a kind of opportunity to see the great splendor of life without memory and consciousness. Being away from human society, being away from um, other humans gives the, uh, the narrator the opportunity to be able to live more intensively in the present as well. And being with animals and witnessing how they live helps her do this. Also ohne Erinnerung und Bewusstsein den großen Glanz des Lebens zu sehen. She mentions how she had forgotten how to see really in all the years that she lived her previous life, her earlier life. And she is slowly regaining this ability after she finds herself behind the wall. Another um, thought that was presented by Jeremy Bentham was the question of um, suffering as a category to investigate or to examine what sort of a status animals should have in society, whereby Bentham said, we sh instead of asking questions like, do they have reason, do they have speech, do they have language, do they have uh, um, hands, etc., what we should be asking is basically, can they suffer? And uh, if the answer to that is yes, which is the case, then uh, then that makes the case for treating them um, the same way that we would treat humans. And uh, the uh, narrator here seems to be thinking along those lines too, where she writes, Sie, die Tiere, leiden wie ich, wenn ihnen ein Schmerz zugefügt wird, und wie ich brauchen sie Nahrung, Wärme und ein bisschen Zärtlichkeit. The animals suffer like me when pain is inflicted on them, and like me, they need nourishment, warmth, and a little tenderness. Again, talking about how uh, one need not think about the difference between humans and animals based on life and death, she states, I fail to see what could be dishonorable about bearing the burden imposed upon oneself like any animal and eventually dying like any animal. I don't even know what honor is. 
to be born and to die is not honorable. It happens to every creature and means nothing beyond that. In this way, she, on the one hand, negates the difference between the deaths of human and non-human animals and appropriates for herself the same kind of death that the animals around her will eventually go through. With this, we come to the second part of the talk, which is about uh, the reflections about writing in the novel um, and writing in a post-human world. Before I start with this, I would like to very briefly go into uh, the idea of the post-human, um, which is an idea that uh, in, in humanities came up largely in the 1990s, therefore about, about 30 years after the publication of The Wall but which has informed a lot of scholarship since then and all the way into the 21st century. So post-humanism basically um, tries to imagine or uh, uh, argues in favor of a world where humanist ideas and tendencies are given up and um, a new approach to life on this planet, to life with humans and non-humans and machines is conceptualized in which one does not orient oneself as the human being somebody um, special or at the pinnacle of civilization or um, evolution and therefore being somehow more privileged than the others. This also connects with ideas of war uh, because modern wars um, are no more uh, wars in which a human subject fights another human subject. There is so much technology involved uh, so much of it in present times is also um, scientifically produced, um, as well as ideas about AI, artificial intelligence. Um, all of these flow into thinking about the post-human. So very, very basically, we can think of it as a condition or as an approach to the world in which the human is not the supreme being or the one in the, um, in, at center stage, and not everything seems to emanate from the idea that everything is about and for the human. In her novel, uh, the narrat in the novel, the narrator writes, Ich schreibe nicht aus Freude am Schreiben. Es hat sich eben so für mich ergeben, dass ich schreiben muss, wenn ich nicht den Verstand verlieren will. I don't write for the joy of writing. It's just that I have to write if I don't want to lose my mind. Writing becomes here a strategy for survival. It's, uh, it's just as she has to learn during the course of her life behind the wall, how to, uh, for her, which is uh, absolutely a new thing, how to grow her own crops in order to survive, how to go hunting in order to survive. She also has to, at some point of time, sit down to write a report about the time that she has uh, gone through. Um, and there is, an important question in her mind, which she has been thinking about. And to find an answer for this, to create this kind of clarity, writing becomes the strategy. And the question is, I don't understand what has happened. I still ask myself why the strange man killed Moops and Stier. So this is the question that has been bothering her because it becomes very, uh, pretty soon in the novel, quite in the beginning of the novel, um, that the dog is dead, that the dog is going to die. Basically, the dog is dead because the entire report is written in retrospective. Um, the narrator starts writing much after the time um, of the coming up of the wall. Um, and she starts writing precisely at the point of time where she has the feeling that she's going to lose her mind if she does not sit down and write some of her memories down and try to make sense of what has happened because everything has been so perplexing so far. In particular for her, um, difficult to understand is the question of this man who appears after a couple of years. It's the, it's the first human being that she sees um, after about two years. And what she sees him doing is killing Luke's and Stier, which leads her to kill him. But she still has no explanation for why he does this. And because the question bothers her, she sits down to write down. Writing 
retrospectively also carries with it the aspect of forgetting because um uh, she details that she had made a few uh, notes about what was going on and then now when she decides to write a report she goes back to those notes and tries to reconstruct the report out of those am 10 december finde ich eine seltsame notiz die zeit vergeht zu so schnell ich erinnere mich nicht sie geschrieben zu haben so looking back at her notes she finds a strange sentence namely time flies so fast and has the feeling that she has no memory of writing this down which again makes her feel that if she does not write things down then they will disappear because she can't trust her memory anymore a lot of what has happened is already being forgotten writing as um as a strategy to survive is at the same time also writing as therapy and so she says Jetzt, after she starts writing, she says, jetzt bin ich ganz ruhig. Ich sehe ein kleines Stück weiter. Ich sehe, dass es noch nicht das Ende ist. Alles geht weiter. Etwas Neues kommt heran und ich kann mich ihm nicht entziehen. After wondering what next, after wondering um, why things happened the way they did, writing calms her down and in that way has a therapeutic sort of effect on her. and she has the feeling that after having summed up everything that she's gone through in the last couple of years she is able to look forward a little bit and to realize that it's not the end yet and that things will go on her life will go on and that perhaps there will be something new that will happen next and she comes to terms with the fact again that she cannot escape it that there is an inevitability and she must um wait for things to happen as they are to happen and uh, respond to them there is also uh, a some amount of reflection about what gender means for her in uh, what we can then call a post human world quite literally as a world after the human as a world in which there are no humans anymore as well as thinking about a world in which the human is not to be seen in more as a part of the as the humanist tradition because the humanist tradition is basically also a tradition in which it was the western male that sort of was considered the human and the others the women for example non human animals for example um people from the global east or the global south were considered as in that sense less human and those aspects of humanism are also questioned with uh, regard to what gender means for uh, the uh, for the narrator in the world behind the wall she says the womanliness of the 40s had fallen away from me with the curls the small double chin and the rounded hips at the same time i lost the awareness of being a woman my body smarter than me had adapted and minimized the discomforts of my femininity i could forget that i was a woman sometimes i was a child looking for strawberries sometimes a young man sawing wood or when i sat on the bench with pierlo that's the cat on my skin knees and watched the sinking sun a very old sexless being she contrasts this also with what her life had been like before she came um, here and found herself uh, captive and redeemed behind the wall because as a woman um, living in the city uh, she had always felt the compunction um, to to pay attention to her appearance so she has uh, also written about how um, um, makeup for example and clothes and uh, hair and nails etc mattered were a, a kind of selbstverständlichkeit for her life before she ended up here and how all of these things don't matter anymore ich dachte kaum einmal an meine erscheinung meinen tieren war es gleichgültig in welcher schale ich steckte Sie liebte mich gewiss, gewiss nicht wegen meines Aussehens. So she stops thinking about her appearance. She hardly thinks about it anymore and explains this 
um, with recourse to the animals who she says doesn't don't care what she looks like and whose love for her does not depend on how she looks. Mein Gesicht sah ganz fremd aus, mager, mit leichten Höhlungen in den Wangen. Meine Tiere hingen an meinem vertrauten Geruch, an meine Stimme und an gewissen Bewegungen. Ich konnte mein Gesicht ruhig ablegen, es wurde nicht mehr gebraucht. And so the idea of this womanliness, the idea of gender being uh, a category that determines who she is, how she is perceived, how she is supposed to perceive herself, stops playing such an important role here once there are no more humans around her, once she is the only human left, and the others around her are the animals who do not anyways orient themselves according to what she looks like, but according to what according to her smell, rather, and uh, her voice and uh, the, the movements that she makes. And therefore, she says, I could easily put away my face. The face does not matter anymore in this world. It's no longer needed in the, in the situation where she finds herself. Talking about writing in a world without humans, uh, the most interesting part of this novel is also that the novel and the uh, report that the narrator writes is um, it's written for other than human addresses. Um, because she's the last person left in the world, or so it seems, she can never be sure or she cannot believe possibly or positively that what she's writing down will ever be read by anybody else. Most probably not. She writes not to be read, but because she needs to write to keep herself sane, writing as therapy, as we said earlier. But this does make her, each time she thinks about why she is writing, each time she thinks about the fact that there are no more humans, she does wonder uh, whether it makes sense to write or why she is writing. Es kränkt mich, aber wer weiß, vielleicht kennt die Katze mich besser, als ich selbst mich kenne und ahnt, wozu ich fähig bin. Während ich dies schreibe, liegt sie vor mir auf dem Tisch und sieht aus großen gelben Augen über meine Schulter auf einen Fleck der Wand. It offends me, but who knows? Maybe the cat knows me better than I know myself and has an inkling of what I'm capable of. As I write this, she's lying on the table in front of me and looking over my shoulder at a spot on the wall with big yellow eyes. So this is a writing, as we said, which is uh, for more than or other than human addresses. At the same time, it is a writing which is being done in the company of other than humans, um, the cat here, for example. This, uh, um, this, these lines from the novel are also, um, they also remind me very much of um, the reader's encounter, his famous encounter with his cat, where uh, the reader writes about being in his uh, bathroom, being naked and realizing that his cat is looking at him and he feels a certain shame confronted with the gaze of the cat. And that sets off a, a chain of thoughts for him um, about what it means to be looked at by the animal other. And um, from that emanates uh, the animal that therefore I am. Similarly here, um, the, the narrator is aware of the fact that even as she sits writing, the cat is observing her. She is writing, so to speak, under the gaze of the cat. Secondly, she wonders who she is writing for and says, mice are much more likely to eat the report. You know, because um, uh, So there are two ways in which mice tie in. First, paper is scarce. She has to use whatever she can find. And uh, there is always the risk that the mice around will eat up the rest of the paper. And therefore, she has to write fast once she has made up her mind to write before the mice can get to the paper. And then realizing that there are probably not going to be any human readers of her report, she comes to the conclusion that she's basically writing for mice you know, um, and says mice are much more likely to eat the report. They probably like to eat written paper just as much as blank paper. It feels strange to write for mice. Sometimes I just have to imagine that I'm writing for people. 
it's a little easier for me then. However, the knowledge that um, there might not be any human readers does not stop her from, um, from continuing with the report. She continues writing as long as she has paper. And once she comes to the end of her um, RPO 4 rat of her supply of paper, um, basically um, calendars and the like that were there in the, uh, in the hunting lodge, the Bericht, the report ends. So this is in that sense, um, a writing for mice and along with mice, writing for animals and also um, uh, along with animals. And um, in this sense, Stefan Herbrechter has argued um, that instead of reading the wall um, as écriture féminine, it would perhaps make better sense to read it as écriture animal. And I would tend to agree with that. Writing also makes sense now, in particular, uh, where all other humans are gone, because now she can write the truth. And uh, that's what she writes here. Ich kann mir erlauben, die Wahrheit zu schreiben. Alle, denen zuliebe ich mein Leben lang gelogen habe, sind tot. So it is precisely because all other humans are dead and um, it's for the sake of humans that she had all her life been compelled to occasionally lie. Now that they're all gone, they're all dead, she is finally free to write the truth, to write without any kind of external control on her. Being alone, being the last one around and um, writing a report of um, experiencing the world, experiencing life as the sole human is connected um, in the beginning with a certain amount of anxiety right in the beginning. But after a while, she gets used to the idea and says, therefore, even being alone, which has accompanied us for so many generations, and here we can think of it in a more um, feminist kind of a thing, dies out with me. Um, uh, just before I started speaking, uh, we had drawn attention also to the fact um, that Haushofer herself um, struggled to write at the same time as um, having to um, uh, perform everything else that she needed to in her domestic life. She had children that she had to look after. And um, in her correspondence with friends, she has often um, written also about the problems that this poses, how the writing sometimes stalls because there is so much else going on that she has to take care of as a woman because certain gender roles are predetermined. And so looking after the children, the household, etc., falls upon her um, and her alone. And this she has also uh, described as an alliance and being alone with her duties, with the, du with the responsibilities that she has to carry on herself, uh, by herself. And this sentence from the novel can be read uh, along with that. So even being alone in the sense as a human, the last human on the planet, or being alone as a woman, which has accompanied us humans on the one hand, or women on the other for so many generations dies out with me. And she says, this is neither good nor bad. It simply is. And we find by this point of time that uh, she is coming to terms with the situation as it is. She is not judging things anymore. She is um, accepting things as they are. There is towards the end of the novel also um, the idea of you know, of, of a more hopeful sort of um, a view of the future, of what the world is going to be like afterwards. It does not end in a dark way with, you know, looks and she are dying and the woman being left behind with a couple of animals and not knowing what else to do. Instead, she has a more hopeful outlook towards the future. Um, and in this future, the human, the woman, see themselves as a part of the larger picture of nature, of the ecology. And um, she sees that this is something that comes more uh, difficult, with greater difficulty to humans. 
and it's easier for non-human animals. And so she says, things happen and I, like millions of people before me, seek a meaning in them because my vanity will not allow me to admit that the whole meaning of an event lies within itself. No beetle that I carelessly step on will see a mysterious connection of universal significance in this event, which is sad for him. We alone are condemned to chase after a meaning which cannot exist. I pity the animals and I pity people because they are thrown into this life without being asked. Perhaps people are more to be pitied because they have just as much sense to fight against the natural course of things. There is no emotion more sensible than love. It makes life more bearable for the lover and the beloved. I can't understand why we had to go the wrong way. I only know that it is too late. Further on, she says, there is no way out because as long as there is a creature in the forest that I could love, I will. And when there's really nothing left, I'll stop living. If all people had been my kind, there would never have been a wall. But I understand why the others always prevailed. Loving and caring for another being is a very tedious business. And maybe now I'm ready to understand the killers too. Their hatred of anything that can create new life must be immense. So by this point of time, we find that she is willing to almost forgive and to start looking at the future. So writing the report has helped her reconcile with the past and to uh, go beyond questioning why and to think about what next. Yeah. Talking again about uh, how she sees what has happened in the past, she says people had played their own games and they almost always ended badly. So this is also in connection with the wars and the Cold War and the uh, threat of nuclear armament. What should I complain about? I was one of them and I couldn't judge them because I understood them so well. It was better to think away from people. The great game of sun, moon and stars was also not invented by man. And this is what she now wants to focus on, on the sun, moon and stars instead of the humans. And that brings us also to the idea of a post-human sort of thinking um, seeing the bigger picture, seeing the human only as a part of, uh, of this universe and not as the only one, as the one who's doing it all. In fact, she struggles still with um, separating between her former, her earlier self and her new self and says, when writing, I find it difficult to distinguish between my former and my new self. Uh, my new self, which I'm sure is not slowly being absorbed by a greater we. And here she has stopped seeing herself as an ish, as an I, and is being and feels that she is gradually, slowly but surely becoming a part of a greater we. Um, and this greater we consists of the non-human animals that are there, but it also consists of the entire cosmos. It consists of the forest in which she is of the streams, of the mountains, of the sky, the sun and the moon around. Sometimes my thoughts get confused and it is as if the forest is beginning to take root in me. So much does she feel connected or, um, or intertwined with the world around her. Um, and to think it's old eternal thoughts with my brain. The I is becoming subsumed in the we, in the forest. And she says, and the forest doesn't want people to come back. And explaining finally how she orients herself in this world where time, as she knew it earlier, has stopped having uh, any significance. She says, I go by the sun or when it doesn't shine by the arrival and departure of the crows. She calls this the crayon site, the crow time and various other signs. I want to know where the exact time has gone now that there are no more people. I would like to end uh, with a quote from the uh, novel, which for me sums up the sort of um, accepting and optimistic tone of the novel. 
um, it comes from not the end of the novel, but somewhere in between, where she's again talking about the concept of time. She says, the indifference and omnipresence of time stretches into infinity like a vast spider web. Billions of tiny cocoons hang, spun in their threads, a lizard lying in the sun, a burning house, a dying soldier, everything dead and everything living. Time is vast and there is still room for new cocoons. A grey, implacable web that holds every second of my life. Maybe that's why it seems so terrible to me, because it keeps everything and doesn't really let anything end. But if time only exists in my head and I'm the last human, it will end after I die. The thought cheers me up. I may have the power to kill time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandey, for that wonderful talk. Um, the floor is now open to questions. Um, uh, Shruti is first out of the gate with the question um, in the chat box. Would the narrator have been as appreciative of animals uh, had the ap apocalyptic rupture? Sorry, this is showing up. Had the apocalyptic rupture not occurred? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Um, so Shruti asks uh, Would the narrator have been as appreciative of animals if the apocalyptic rupture had not occurred? Probably not, because she also contrasts uh, the sort of insight that she's gotten into living with animals after the apocalypse, after the wall, with her life earlier. And she, as a city dweller, says she had absolutely nothing to do with animals. She didn't even notice them. They played absolutely no role in her life. Um, and it is after finding herself separated from all other humans finding herself in a world where probably there are never going to be any more humans, and especially um, in the initial days where Lux is with her, and that's the only other living presence, so to speak, that accompanies her at a time of great anxiety, at a time of great uncertainty, that she gradually comes to realize what this means, this sort of uh, being with non-human animism. Um, how that also opens up questions about what it means to be human once one is the only human left. We have another question in the chat box. Uh, Pranjal would like to know, could you talk more about this dichotomy between a utopia and a dystopia when we discuss the disruption of quote unquote ordinary life and how only women and animals survive? You talked about our hopefulness towards the future and this reminded me of the same. So um, the contrast or the distinction between utopia and dystopia? Uh, yes, uh, utopia and dystopia when we discuss the disruption of ordinary life, those are. Um, there, there isn't, um, I mean, it's the, the two of them are intertwined. What seems to her and all of us like dystopia in the beginning, you know, um, a world where everybody is dead or, I mean, it's not even specified that they are dead. They seem to be frozen where they were. And the whole thing is extremely mysterious, but one can assume based on also what the narrator um, um, assumes that some kind of a perhaps nuclear catastrophe has occurred or it's, as she says, a kind of a Geheimwaffe, a secret weapon that um, one or the other of the superpowers has developed that nobody knew about and maybe they've tried it out. And so, you know, everything's come to an end. And initially it seems like a dystopia. It seems like a world where everything's come to an end and there's this woman who's stuck behind a wall and does not know if she will ever manage to come out. Um, in the beginning, she's also trying to make attempts to find out what's going on. She's engaging more and more with the question of what is this? Um, there's a car parked outside and she tries to go to see if she can play the radio on the car to get some news to figure out what the world outside is saying about what has happened or to even get an idea of whether this um, apocalypse or this catastrophe has only happened in her part of the world or if it's global. And then once she can't find any news and um, can't find any answers really, she just kind of stops trying, um, stops thinking about this. And beyond, I would say, um, the first 20 pages or 30 pages, 
she never comes back to the question of what was this or how did it happen. And we see very clearly how she comes to terms with this, what she thinks initially is a dystopia, because she starts realizing that it is actually in a way quite utopian. And a very good sign of that is when she catches herself uh, carrying the knife around, um, placing the knife under her pillow at night, and then suddenly wondering, why am I doing this? Who's going to come to kill me or to harm me in any way if there are no more humans around? And everything that she's known of danger so far has come from humans. And uh, there, I think, is the moment where this dystopia sort of quite tangibly turns into the idea of a utopia, of, of a world order, of a kind of life, of a way of living that has never been before and seems scary because it is so unknown, but which the more she tries it out, uh, the more she realizes she does not mind it. And in fact, she starts quite liking it and realizes that there's a lot that she sees now, a lot that she feels now, a lot that she's aware of now, to which she had always been blinded earlier. And that's also interesting because there is this whole idea of civilization as um, as the opportunity to um, to learn, to reflect, to think. Um, and in the case of the, of the narrator here, it's coming away from human civilization that has enabled all of these processes. As long as she was in the city, she was not thinking about, for example, what it means to be a human. And it's only now that she raises such questions and uh, certain prejudices that she might have carried earlier also now reveal themselves as prejudices to her quite clearly, and she's able to question those as well. So it's, it's a very subtle sort of movement from seeing the situation, seeing the scenario as dystopian, and then um, realizing that it isn't, that it's actually uh, almost utopian. No? And it's interesting also that this question is asked because in all the reading that I've done on uh, Divand, um, it's never discussed as a dystopian novel because I think that aspect is so clear that this is not a dystopia. Mm -hmm. Especially this is um, that it could be read as a kind of alternative uh, way of life or as, uh, as a kind of shaking up of the world to show, look, this is what's going to happen if you don't stop, if you don't think. And secondly, um, look, this is also a way of living, which will perhaps slow down the disaster towards which we are all leaving, uh, to, uh, towards which we are all going. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question because um, I was thinking about this a lot because the New Yorker actually published a review of the uh, of the wall making uh, making a case for thinking of it as a kind of process from dystopia to utopia. And the question that I have is, yes, I mean, on the one hand, part of that is predicated on the fact that there are no other humans, but then we find out at the end there is another human in the landscape during this whole time, the whole narrative time frame of her writing of the report. But then she doesn't know. So how does that, I mean, it, I, I think it ends up being rather uh, quite ambivalent. But. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, as far as she knows, as far as she assumes, given the fact that she hasn't seen any other humans, she comes to the conclusion that there aren't any more. And of course, the novel leaves the question open because just as this one man got through at some point of time, maybe there are others out there, maybe they will turn up. Maybe this world uh, that she's inhabiting at the end um, will also change. And that's the, that's the note that she strikes towards the end to say, I just know that there's more that's going to happen. This is not the end. And uh, whether it will be good or not, I don't know. But one needs to be prepared for this. And I think sitting down and writing, summing up her memories, putting them down on paper prepares her somehow. It's sort of like, you know, being done with the past and being able finally to look forward to the future. Um, Madhu Sani has her hand up. Hi, Anu. Thanks. Hi, Madhu. Very 
interesting reading of House of a text which one has read a million, uh, hundred years ago, really. But there were two things I wanted to ask you. One, House of a takes, I mean, in many of her other texts, smaller texts, where she's actually always engaging with nature in some form or the other. But the ones that I have read, I haven't read all of House of her, they happen in the city. And here she takes this and puts it in a, in a world where you can have this kind of an experience. So uh, that itself actually already places it as, okay, she's talking about nature, but is it only about nature that she's talking in that sense, you know? And the second thing I was wondering about is, you know, now that we have started talking about the nature in, uh, not in this, in this, you know, post anthropocene post human, this kind of stuff, not just the representation of nature that one had read for always, so the question is the other texts that always dealt, always had uh, animals in the center, they are not really seen as very high literature. No? The Märchen, the Zagen, the Legenden, which always had, whether, you know, they're not high literature. So in that sense, it's taken us very long to come to the idea. But of course, animals again represented, and trees. Uh, there I won't talk only about animals because even trees and nature and all other things that surround us were equal partners in those texts. Here they're not, you know? I mean, in the so-called high literature, they were not. It's always about how was nature represented with A, B, and C. So I was just wondering about this, you know? I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether it's a very clear question, but it always just strikes me that, you know, we never took those texts and put it in the middle of the canon. They were always mm. the, you know, the outside texts mm. that form the basis, they give you the motives, they give you this for these texts, you know? Uh, thanks, Padu. Uh, to get down to your first question, first, I would say that uh, placing this novel, this narrative in the, in the world is the way I see it. Um, it's it enables a certain kind of civilization critique to come up because in this movement away from the city as let's say the the schauplatz der civilization der kultur etc etc uh, there is a more sort of a radical break with what that was and so this um, uh, this sort of a possibility of a radically different sort of setting you know, um, it's not just the absence of humans, it's also the absence of all the institutions that um, that go with humans, most particularly in a sort of um, urban setting. And I tend to read the novel also as something which is, uh, which is a critique of civilization to a large, large extent. And for me, therefore, uh, placing uh, the whole, um, uh, the handloom here, in a forest makes sense in that in in that kind of a sense. I don't know if that um, if if um, I said that clearly. Too. The forest too is part of the civilization. Look, they've got a it is it lost. is. Mm. Got mm. a car outside there. Mm. All mm. that is still there, you know. So if just yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of looking at it as um as a movement away from and um I guess if um. If she had remained in the city, some of the animals that happen in the text would not have been possible. You know? So it's only in the um, in the COVID sort of times that we've had all these videos of uh, fox and bears and whatever wandering through the cities, uh, which probably back then was not really uh, something that one had imagined could happen. And so this sort of treno between you know the city and the forest was was more. Um, sort of geographically two different distinct entities with their own baggage that comes with them. And you're right, of course, there is the yak shooter. Hunting in itself as an activity is also a part of the whole civilizational process. She continues with that, of course, um, and the car and the radio and even the writing of the report, all of that is there. But still, I feel um, moving away from the city enables the integration of certain animals um, and certain ways of living, the necessity to grow her own crops, for example, which would not have been uh, possible otherwise. And um, about your second question, uh, this is something that we talk about a lot in animal studies, uh, the idea of, um, well, the animals 
being invisibilized in certain kinds of texts because they are read not as animals, but largely as um, metaphors for something uh, that is human, which is what happens in Fabian, for example, but also in a whole lot of other texts. And um, there has been, of course, for the longest possible time, the, the thought that only children would probably be interested in animals in texts, you know, adults wouldn't possibly because, uh, you know, it's not serious stuff. And so uh, one thinks of Miashan and stuff also as something which is not high literature, but which can also be seen in that sense as kinder literature. And therefore um, animals figure there because children respond to them and all of those, that line of thought. Uh, this is being increasingly um, questioned now in animal studies, particularly literary animal studies scholarship as of the last, uh, I'd say 15, 20 years to say, um, there is a need to embrace these gatungan, which one had seen as non-serious, non-literary, or not as high literature, um, and to then examine them as texts in which animals appear and which are literary without letting um, oneself be distracted by the, fa by the uh, fact that they are not, in that sense, high literature. And so a lot of scholarship is emerging exactly on these texts, which one didn't really um, look at. I uh, also had this thing when I started working um, about 13 years ago. Um, and where I teach now, um, they include in the, um, in the syllabus all these sort of texts, you know, the Miesh and the Fab and the Zag, and et cetera, et cetera. And in the beginning, I was extremely clueless. I didn't know what to do with them in the class because what do, in the literature class, you know, like not in the language class, but in the literature class, like you've got a semester where you're supposed to be reading Mershan and Fabel and Zabin and whatever else, anecdota and stuff. And what do you do besides reading the text? And for me, uh, <laughs> literary animal studies has <laughs> saved my life. <laughs> because now we can do things with those texts. And so I kind of crammed this down the throats of all my students now, um, regardless of whether they'd like to or not, because it, it means that we don't just need to read the texts as, you know, okay, texts in German, which we don't understand, so let's go through them. We can now actually analyze the texts. We can try to interpret them by connecting them to a discourse outside, and uh, they learn how to do this also, for example. Um, I'm going to cut ahead in line and actually ask a question because it dovetails on part of the answer that you just gave. Um, and regarding this issue about animals in the forest versus animals in the city, my question as I was listening to your talk was uh, whether you could comment or whether you had thoughts on the distinction and the status between quote unquote wild animals and quote unquote domestic animals in the text. because. Of course, I mean, a lot of the reflections on animals do revolve around, you know, she has her cow and her cats and her dog. Um, at the end, of course, her companion is this white crow that shows up kind of mysteriously in the last yes. uh, 10 pages of the novel. So, yes. um, yeah, I, that's my question. What uh, what thoughts do you have about the way that uh, the way that the novel thinks about dom the domestic animal? Um. I don't see, as far as I can see, there isn't really a very big departure from the norm in the way domestic animals and their relationship with the domestic animals is depicted here. Uh, so there is, you know, um, a fair amount of anthropomorphizing, which again, I would like to state, I don't see as a problem. I see that as a valid strategy in, um, in depicting um, animals, non-human animals, as well as the human animal bond in that sense. But um, there, there are uh, other animals. Uh, there, there are the fox, for example, out in the forest. And when the cat doesn't come back, she assumes that um, it's been killed by the fox or by some other animal, wild animal out there. Uh, there are the deer in the forest that she goes to hunt sometimes because she needs the food. Um, there are the chamois, etc. Uh, there is the white crow whose um, life she kind of imagines, she feels a little sorry for the white crow because she feels that it's a kind of an ausenseiter. It's kind of uh, pushed away by the other regular black crows. And um, she um, 
quite romantically hopes that there is another white crow out there somewhere so that the two of them can, you know, get together and the white crow won't be lonely anymore. But uh, for the for the most part, I have the feeling that the animals that come up in this novel and the ones that she writes about, the ones that she thinks about, are all domestic animals. And there is not so much thought given to, um, to uh, the wild tier uh, besides what she writes about hunting. I did not find anything else um, in the novel. Um, it's also, uh, I mean, I tend to see this also as, as a kind of, proto uh, posthuman writing you know it's not yet posthumanism but it's starting to be it's it's a kind of a precursor of imagining a world in which it's not necessarily only about the human or primarily about the human and um, in animal studies also we've seen how um, initially the interest was for domestic animals those are the ones that people have known the closest for the longest possible time and spend the maximum amount of time with or are the most emotionally invested in. And then, you know, scholarship and also literary writing started going beyond that to embrace wild animals. And then uh, we find now that there are also um, insects which play a really prominent role. So um, it's been, I think, a kind of a step-by-step -step movement. And given the fact that Haushofer wrote in the 1960s, and uh, to reiterate, the animal turn hadn't yet happened. Um, her interest in the non-human is quite understandably coming from the perspective of someone with her biography and uh, in the perspective of the biography, so to speak, of the narrator of the text. It kind of makes sense because for her, it's already, I think, a fairly big deal that she is with non-human animals now and is learning how to deal with them. She's learning how to milk a cow. She's never done that before. Or I think she says that she did it once as a child when she visited a farm or something, but hasn't done it since then and has to learn how to do it again. The cow needs to be milked and um, she must do it. Similarly, she assists in the birth of the calf. And that again, for her is something that she's never done before. So that for herself, for her is already fairly radical, you know, transcending the, the kind of species boundary and being involved with beings that are not humans, trying to figure out how to engage with them. Um, and yeah, the other animals out there are mentioned, uh, the white crow because of his singularity and because of his sort of aus and zaita status arouses her compassion. She hopes he will find a friend soon. Um, and she observes the other crows. She knows that there are other animals out there, but they don't figure more than that really in the narrative. So uh, there are several questions in the chat box uh, and some of the people who pose questions in the chat box have also put up their hands. So I'll work, um, what I'll do is I'll work my way down through the chat box questions. And then for those of you who post in the, in the chat box and also have your hands up, then when I come to you, I will give you the floor and you can ask one for your if, if it's the same question, then you can ask whatever. So uh, the first question, the next question on deck is from Ashva Kumar Reddy. And he asks, um, the main character reflects on the role of language in shaping our perceptions of reality and the limitations of language in conveying the full depth and complexity of human experience. How does this reflection relate to the character's experience of isolation and her attempts to communicate with the outside world? And what insights does it provide into the novel's broader themes of communication and connection? Um, how do you mean the communicating with the outside world? Because that's not possible in the, in the novel, really. I mean, she's writing a report of what has happened in the last couple of years at some point of time, but she's also writing it with the knowledge that it's never going to be written, to be read by others. So um, I would tend not to see it really as an attempt to communicate. I would, like I said, see it more as a form of um, as a form of therapy or as a part of her survival strategy, as something to do which 
helps her focus as something to do which helps her find a certain kind of closure with what has happened and enables her to go on um because the possibility of this report being read by anybody is uh quite negligible from her perspective at that point of time at least and that's why this whole thing of um uh, uh, writing for mice no um because they are the only ones around who will probably consume her writing and quite literally consume her writing in eating up the papers so uh i want to pick up i th i think we can pick up on this question of writing for mice um and we have two questions that take that issue up i'm going to uh give the floor to pranjal because she posed a question about that um pranjal if you want to ask that question you have in the chat box if you want to take the direction elsewhere that's up to you uh thank you so much dr philip uh so just right before uh, we get on to the questions i will say that we're running a little short on time so maybe if we could uh just have uh, one more question if anybody might want to ask and we could have some concluding remarks right after that i i'll leave that to your wisdom dr okay. <laughs> you <can laughs> um so uh, what uh p who has her hand up um um yes doctor thank you so much um so i i believe you once once mentioned that the wall is not exactly a human centric novel but uh, do you think that in contrast to that there might exist a larger uh, inclination towards how the human life in specific was uh, disrupted by the apocalyptic uh, circumstances whether animals simply added a secondary though of course um a crucial perspective like even though the novel speaks about only one individual in particular do you think that this singular experience can be uh, generalized in terms with human nature or how any human if uh, put in the same situation would act or perhaps how a man would act considering that um, it is a feminist piece after all um i would say uh, uh pihu thank you for the question um i i would say that this is um well the singularity of the narrator is a uh, sort of stressed repeatedly in the novel she's the only one left and she's a woman but at the same time the fact that the novel is published and put out there to be read by the public um, makes it explicit also that this is not only about one human that it is about um all of humanity about the world um about all of us and um one way to see this would be that it represents a sort of reminder that um that one needs to rethink the way one's been living um in particular the way uh, humans have been um, behaving themselves let's say uh, um in the way they control nature in the way they um invent things in the way they test those things in the way they uh, think of everything in this world including non human animals natural resources etc cetera, etc cetera, as objects for their consumption and the novel presents the idea that there is a certain finitude that nature the earth the world it's not infinite at some point of time we are going to run out of things and uh, in that sense it's time to perhaps rethink how we are going about stuff which are incidentally the same kind of thoughts that one also had during the time of the pandemic where um this the lockdowns and the slowing down and being stuck at home and not being able to order uh, uh 500 things per week made people um sort of question the sort of consumerist culture that's been there and which has been driving um a lot of problems for the ecology and yeah, the sort of um a uh, really explicit over the top consumption um the pollution and all of these things which are anthropogenic they are a result of human actions and uh, the wall kind of presents a world where we've tried to connect this to the cold war and uh, to the nuclear apocalypse and uh, the possibility of you know um, uh, bombs and stuff but we could also read it today in connection with i mean the the wall could be a new strain of covid 
for for that matter it could be a new disease that strikes the world it could be some other kind of uh, apocalypse it could be because of the rising sea levels because of uh, glacial melting it could be just about anything and what we find there is that two points are made very clear one when that happens it's not just going to be us humans that are um, affected it's going to be everybody else as well and once everything else is stripped away and we come down to the bare minimum there are a lot of things that don't matter anymore you know uh, like this whole idea of uh, the difference the anthropological difference between humans and animals doesn't matter in this sort of scenario so that would be one thing that i think one could read into the novel or read from the novel the second would be that um one needs to act no uh, one needs to uh, change what's going on um <clears throat> in one's own behavior in one's own approach to the planet to nature um if one reads it as a war novel as as the as something which is connected to weapons and wars then one needs to rethink that approach if one reads it as something that's connected to a more climate crisis kind of an apocalypse then that's something one needs to think about so it makes us question everything that we've always believed about being humans and being in that sense better superior the best and therefore the ones who make the decisions by confronting us with the consequences of the decisions that we've made in this belief and secondly it tells us to stop doing that and to uh, change the way we go about the rest of our lives So I'm told that uh, we do have uh, time to take more of the questions that have come in. Uh, so if it's okay with you, Dr. Pandey, we can proceed with a few more. Um, I'm going to pose two questions that are in the chat box that both pick up on this issue of writing from ice, and then you can respond to them um, because I think they're they're pretty closely related. So Ananya asks, uh, "I find the idea of writing from ice very interesting. Do you think it's an idea taken from the author's own life as a housewife?" the idea of writing for yourself as a woman with no possibility uh no possibility of the world actually appreciating your work more than empowering it could be very well just be a way quote to keep to keep sane as it was for the narrator the next question we have on this issue of writing for mice um comes from pranjal um so i read it aloud for you or i'll, I'll read it aloud when she quote writes for mice and expresses her anxiety towards it what do you think is the feeling that she's tapping into could you argue that it's a fear of a meaningless existence from survival and survivalism drawing from marlene harshof hausofer's personal experience as a housewife okay thank you um this thank you for the two questions uh, because they also open up a new way of looking at uh, the writing for mice i hadn't thought of it in connection with uh, her own identity um her own background and what writing meant for her um i did happen to read about the circumstances under which she wrote and she's um mentioned quite a few times how she struggled to make the time and um uh and also struggled with the fact that um it's always more difficult for women authors to be published and then secondly to be taken seriously um and these are these are concerns that she had i I had not read the writing for my uh, bit in this light but you are right that could um, reflect some of those anxieties um i i'm not sure really that writing for my is something that makes the narrator anxious in the novel she says um, that she she pretends or she thinks or she likes to believe that there will still be human readers because it makes the process of writing easier for her but that's also more a question of habit as a human who's lived in society she is used not to write she's not used to writing not for humans but for non humans and therefore for her if she sits down to write thinking no human is going to ever read this it's difficult for her to to frame the sentences and therefore she continues writing as if she would be read but she knows at the same time she would not be read by people and she's okay with that you know and um there is in fact uh, a complete acceptance of the fact that she's writing for Kim Moiser and that uh 
her writing will help them no um, it will become their food in that sense uh, but this also this this idea of a creature animal writing for mice in this case is also tied into the idea of um, writing um, or language uh, beyond the human and um, i think i mentioned briefly uh, somewhere earlier on in the presentation that uh, the concept of writing has and the concept of language has been expanded quite a bit to include other forms of um, of language let's say non human more than human forms of language uh, so for example if you have a dusty surface and uh, a mice scurries over it then the trail left by the mouse on um, on the dusty surface is really also a form of communication it is also a language it's not language in the way we in the humanist tradition have all this thought of language but of course it is a language using which the mouse denotes his presence leaves traces of his presence tells us i was here it's the same thing that happens when a slug crawls over the floor and leaves the telltale mark behind it's the same thing that happens when a dog pees everywhere to mark his presence to say i was here huh? and um these are also ideas which kind of uh, which which i was thinking of all the time when i was thinking about this writing for mice business because um she's writing under the gaze of an animal so she's being observed by an animal and of course the gaze of the cat makes her think again and again and in a different way of what it means to write um being observed by a non human gives a certain direction to her writing and then the realization the certainty actually that no human eyes are going to fall upon her writing instead it's probably going to end up in uh, in the stomachs of mice in the jaws of mice is um makes the writing more and more animal in that sense no it's um written with animals and it's written for animals and therefore then the whole question of uh, i mean this emanates from the whole question of why write if there's no one left to read your writing and um the novel presents itself in that sense of justification for writing because writing need not be writing in the human humanist anthropocentric sense it can be something else um there was another uh, citat that i had where she um where she thinking about imagining um that lux is still alive and that she's behind her all the time that he's following her through the jungle and she can hear almost the sound of twigs crackling and stuff because it's so real for her and that used to be i didn't have the entire citat but further on there it goes on also to show how that was a part of her communication with looks as well you know not just the gaze not just the wagging tail not just the pointy ears etc cetera, etc cetera. it was also this um communication that happened when she and looks went out and he always accompanied her and she's so used to this language to this um this communication that for her when he's not there anymore a she's imagining that it's still ongoing and she does not have conversations with humans in her head she doesn't at all but this sort of uh, more than human conversation looks goes on and secondly um it's it informs also her own take on what it means to write and what um or whom she's writing again to get back to that uh this is probably a good moment actually to shift from um that to Chioti's question you know moving from the conditions of writing both historically and diegetically in the novel to the novel's reception Chioti asks uh, could you please elaborate on the shift that takes place in the reception of this novel in the 80s when it was celebrated as a feminist text to its representation as a posthumanist novel okay um the novel wasn't a really big success when it first came out so in the 1960s 1963 when it was published it was just i think like modestly successful um and not really very widely read not very widely commented on this changed in the um in the 1980s when it was kind of 
rediscovered for the first time. Um, you mentioned how it was rediscovered in that sense after the COVID pandemic as well um, by the New York Times in the article. Um, but it's had in that sense multiple rediscoveries, so to speak. And the first major one would be in the 1980s and the early 1980s, I would say, because that's also the time where, uh, I mean, coincides with certain movements in uh, feminist thought. And here's now a novel that people sort of rediscover to say, look, it shows the isolation of a writing female subject. Um, and then it shows also um, how, I mean, read in another way, it shows how she finds herself captive, but at the same time liberated from patriarchy. So the world in which she is in is also a world in which patriarchy doesn't exist anymore because there's no one to impose it, let's say. Uh, that was sort of one reading of the novel which made it become um, popular again. The second one was with the uh, uh, with the freedom's bewegung, with the peace movements, with the movements uh, which started already in the nineteen seventies against um, atomara aufrüstung, against um, uh, nuclear armaments, uh, the arms race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, here then was a novel which was rediscovered, which seemed to show a post-apocalyptic world, a world in which um, during the Cold War, approximately, a secret weapon or a certain kind of bomb or whatever had wiped everything out. Huh? And so it was um, seen more as a lesson. Look, this is what happens if you don't um, stop change um, the way you're going about things. Um, so that becomes uh, the second moment where, um, well, the sort of rediscovery of the novel happened because the because the movie came out and the movie was I don't know if some of us have watched it but it's also really nicely done it's it's also extremely engaging um, and I won't comment on whether it's exactly like a novel or if it departs from the novel or whatever because I think if that's like a question that's immaterial but um, but let's say it complements the novel very beautifully so if you read the novel and then you go on and you watch the movie um, it's it's usually a very rewarding experience and the reviews for the movie obviously then drew attention again to the novel as as such also because um, yeah one knew that there was a novel behind it and the final thing was um, I think because during the COVID times during the pandemic I was also attending a whole lot of online talks and lectures and conferences and stuff as all of us were doing and there seemed to be a real explosion of interest in the novel again, where I think the theme of isolation, the theme of an apocalypse was something that resonated with what people were going through. The theme of isolation, being stuck in a place, um, resonated. The theme of there being no normal humans resonated because the cities, the streets, everything was deserted. One didn't see anything any more people anymore um, and then of course uh, this sort of renewed interest in non-human animal life uh, which was fed also by all the videos one saw of all the things that animals were up to while we were all locked up indoors um, also fed into that so yeah it's had multiple waves of uh, sort of a resurrection if you like well, we have one more person who's sitting on a question. And so, uh, Pallavi, if you'd like to go ahead, you have the floor. Yeah, hi, Anu. Am I audible? Yes, absolutely. OK, yeah. Uh, I think it's fine if I don't uh, switch on the video camera. <laughs> sure, OK, sure. so yeah. So um, uh, since you have talked about the idea of suffering, and that's where you know uh, one can connect. And also, you have already mentioned like the relevance of uh, this text in terms of classroom teaching and how we can connect students with this larger theme of nature, ecology, and then uh, where we are heading to. So my question is also coming back to the idea of suffering and uh, also connecting it to the real world that we all are right now living, uh, where I see some spaces as, you know, uh, space for suffering, uh, 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 animals suffering. And for instance, if you take uh, one example of zoo, 
so as a, i mean how do you you know comment on that i mean uh, do we need uh, such spaces in order to you know tell our uh, kids okay if you want to see animals let's go to zoo because it's not part of our lives and also not to be aware of the uh, fact that it is a space where animals actually suffer so uh, i i would like to know your comment on that yeah thank you pallavi that's really interesting and i'm glad you brought it up um i have found usually um, in my experience as uh, somebody who's been teaching um, literature for a while now that texts which are about animals in which you want to look at the animal as the animal do not necessarily immediately meet with an enthusiastic response in class i don't blame the students for that it's because of the way it's because of the world in which we live right where um the humanist tradition still thrives and those who are not human are largely invisibilized including their suffering right there are a whole lot of things that are not recognized as suffering because nobody's ever drawn attention to them because nobody's ever looked at the person or the creature who is suffering the zoo is a great example of that uh, it's it's been since the longest possible time in india at least seen as you know the destination where one takes their children and one thinks of it as um uh, you know kind of in a very positive way as uh, Oh, where else will my children get to see animals? You know, real animals, and they will get to love animals, etc., etc. Like we get to see them; it's glorious. But it's deeply disturbing because uh, you basically take your children to show them captive animals who have no, who should not be where they are, right? And um, I think engaging with literary texts and connecting them, and that's the second part, which I think really plays an important role here. Um, engaging with concerns in literary texts and then concerning and then connecting them tangibly with concerns in the real world uh, can go a really long way in making people look at things that are there but which are invisibilized which are not noticed because nobody is paying attention to them animals for example you know? and then um, uh, one can of course also contrast by taking a text like this or any other text in which an animal figures and then in the discussion around the text bring in something about the real world scenario to say okay we brought the animals here and then where else does one get to see animals for example in the zoo and then lead the students to kind of draw those conclusions and then i find that usually afterwards they don't see the world in the same way anymore which is actually the whole point of reading any literary text right i mean not just texts about humans we basically do the same thing uh, with texts that have to do with women for example women are invisibilized now how many men for example uh, would have ever thought considered what it means to be raped you know? but in your presentation for example uh, in the last uh, monday session you brought about certain thoughts certain ideas which i'm sure were things that certain people had never thought of they had never thought of it in those ways you know yeah sure it exists it's a crime it's not a good thing but that's it but really getting to uh, to hear to read to understand to some extent what it implies what it means is the change that literature can bring about but then again like i said just reading the text doesn't work because at the end of the day it's just a text in german which is difficult to read and yeah you know so one has to kind of get beyond that by connecting it to something in the learners in the students own lebenswelt which they know very well and then somehow on the one hand access to the text in a foreign language is made easier and on the other hand once eyes are opened to things in the real world which one had never quite noticed in that sense no pallavi does does that answer what you had asked yes yes anu absolutely yes thank you so that covers the discussion then i'm really gratified that we ended by thinking about some of the pedagogical implications of the sort of theoretical issues that are at stake in uh, the discussion of household for today so 
uh, I'll go ahead and also yield the floor because I believe there are some final remarks. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Alexander. And um, should I thank everybody now or is there something else to be said? So thank you again yeah. to the General Global University, in particular to Shruti Jain. Thank you also to the DRD for supporting this endeavor. Thank you, Alexander, for moderating the session, for all the wonderful questions, for patiently <laughs> letting me ramble through my answers. And uh, thank you to all those who made the time to be here and for your very um, invigorating questions. Uh, they will ensure that I continue thinking about this novel further on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Anu. Uh, it has um, been really a, a very... I mean, see, I was just trying to think animation, animated discussions, animated audience, and a discussion on animals and so much food for thought. So I was very, very uh, happy with the discussion, especially the questions that came up, they were so relevant and uh, they did enhance our understanding of the text as well. And thank you so much for calmly, patiently going through the text as as you always do, and meticulously describing what you yourself also believe in, your philosophy in life. And that comes across so beautifully in what you say. So I really love, love to listen to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pihu? Oh, and I forgot to thank Pihu and Pranjal. <laughs> Thank you to the two of you. <laughs> You've guided us through the entire session, held our hands virtually. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandey and Dr. Phillips uh, for your insights. I think we've got a lot to think about after the session. So I will, um, Ranjal, can we get the concluding remarks? Sir? Definitely. Thank you so much, Pim. And thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. Thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. Thank you so much, Dr. Jen. Uh, I think this course is slowly turning me away from law and into literature very soon at this rate. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this brings us to the end of our session. Uh, we are extremely glad to have you here. And uh, thank you so much to our panel. Thank you to the Center for Foreign Languages. Thank you to the DAD. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Shruti Jain, as we all, you took us through this book with the perspective of your extensive research and your influence on German literature. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to look at uh, this text called Malina by Ingborg Bachmann as uh, Dr. Jain had already introduced uh, previously. Uh, and it's scheduled for next Monday at 6 p.m. Uh, I'm just sharing the invite on the chat box here so you can take a look and access the meeting link from there. Uh, Malina is a Viennese text that follows a very similar narration style to the unnamed narrator that we had in the wall, but uh, it'll transcend the wall's challenge to temporal solitary ex existence. And it looks more into the psyche of women in conflict as they navigate their community identity through interpersonal relationships and their sexuality. So please join us on Monday as Dr. Shruti Jain will join uh, Professor Madhu Sani from the JNU University, uh, from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi to interrogate these themes in the context of Bachmann's eclectic writing style and her influence as an Austrian author on German literature. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all there and hope you're able to draw from today's lecture to have an equally engaging conversation next time. Uh, thank you so much and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you for joining. And now, as Pranjal has already announced, we are meeting uh, on next Monday. Thank you so much, Alexander, uh, for sharing the session. You did it so wonderfully. My neighbor from across the NH44, <laughs> we, we should meet quickly. Uh, maybe I would also like to love to invite you over. And, we... and shared uh, also a co DAD dealer at the same time. <laughs> I wish I remembered. We must have met back in <laughs> way back a long time ago in Berlin. I'm convinced it happened. <laughs> all right. So uh, a very warm outfit is in to all of you. <laughs>